the first Sicario we're going to talk about in this series is a man named Jesus Ernesto Chavez, a.k.a. El Camelo, which means the pusher in Spanish. I mean, he's of Mexican descent, but he's an American. He's a member of an El Paso street barrio Azteca. And I chose him because uh, this really lets us get into not just the brutality, but the economic and ties between both sides of the border down there in the southwest and its possible implications for the future of crime here on this side. Now, El Camelo is today in federal prison, presumably. He's supposed to be doing life, but I'm sure they changed his name. At the least, they have him in a witness segregation. Who knows? Maybe one day he'll get out. Uh, possible he's out now. I kind of doubt it, considering the crimes he uh, had to plead guilty to. He admitted that he controlled a group of hit squads of Sicarios that were responsible for at least 2,000 people in Juarez in less than a year. He said he stopped counting after a while. And this was during that the big flare up of the war we all kind of heard about back in 08, 09 when Juarez went crazy because El Chapo and Sinaloa wanted to take over for Vicento, from Vicente Carrillo Fuentes, who was the uh, nephew, I guess, of Amado Carrillo Fuentes, the Lord of the Skies, the guy who supposedly died getting plastic surgery in 97 after uh, transporting 25 billion in cocaine during the late 80s and 90s. So El Camelo, like I said, is a member of a U.S. street gang. He was born in El Paso, and El Paso and Juarez actually are kind of like the same city. It's just El Paso's on the U.S. side of the border, and uh, Juarez on the south. El Camelo is from Barrio Azteca. It has a gang formed in Texas prison system around 1986 for guys out of El Paso. I mean, Texas is such a big state. You know, you got gangs just even by region, just like in California, you got Nortenos and Serenos, but Barrio Azteca has become a serious organized crime. So just like in Tijuana with the gangs out of Logan Heights who have been implicated as being assassins or were for the Ariano Felix brothers uh, when they were attempting to fend off El Chapo, which they didn't. I mean, Chapo got Tijuana and got most of Juarez. That's why he became number one for a while. Um, uh, the Logan Heights guys, Barrio Logan Heights, uh, two of them were convicted of being involved in Catholic Cardinal at the Guadalajara, Guadalajara Airport. And in El, pa El Paso, Barrio Azteca, uh, started working with La Linea, which was the line, the police line, the Juarez police who worked with different elements of the Juarez C.A.R.T.E.L. or the various, I mean, I, there is no C.A.R.T.E.L. There's different groups of people that sometimes work together and sometimes are enemies. And Barrio Azteca was coming across the border to kill lots of people so not just the guns that do the homicides in Mexico, but some of the people are coming from our side. So it's important when you, when you think about what's going on, it's not, you'll read articles about saying, you know, making reference to like the Aztec-like brutality of south of the border. Well, a lot of it, or some of it is done by American citizens. And in fact, uh, Edgar Villarreal, AKA La Barbie, the Barbie, the Ken doll, who was the blonde-haired, green-eyed Laredo, Texas football player who ended up becoming the uh, most powerful gringo narco ever. La Barbie is one of the people uh, in Nuevo Laredo, another city that straddles a border with the U.S. city, Laredo, where he was from, elevated the scale and brutality of the violence. So you had an American-born guy in a low-crime suburban Laredo, Texas. Ciudad Juarez and El Paso form the largest bilingual, binational workforce in the entire Western Hemisphere. Uh, they're really just one city separated by the fact that they're different countries, but they blend into each other. Hundreds of thousands of people pass across the border each day, just like in 
San Diego, Tijuana. And that's what uh, was interesting me, for me to think about as it pertains to the future of what's going to happen with crime and CAR tells in America. Because if you already have people like Barrio Azteca coming across the border to do work and the work coming from across the border to the U.S., pretty soon these cities might start blending together and you could have formerly low crime places like San Diego, Laredo. 2011 maybe testified El Camelo uh, admitted to an astounding 800 rooms in Juarez while overseeing 800 rooms. And El Camelo said that the Barrio Azteca hit squads were given a quota eight hours a day at the peak of the action. And remember, Barrio Azteca was helping uh, elements in Juarez along with La Linea, which was the, well, Juarez police that had all gone to the dark side to fend off El Chapo, trying to take over the smuggling route through Juarez. And uh, so eight homicides a day was their quota at the peak of the war, wow. Okay, like I was saying, these uh, cities that are the main border crossings for substances from the south, uh, El Paso, Juarez, Tijuana, San Diego, and Nuevo Laredo, Laredo, uh, you see that the Americans uh, are a part of the problem, not just with buying the substances, sending the guns, but it's even really brutal people going over there. And I think it's a sign that, uh, you know, all human beings will do the same thing given a lawless environment. Speaking of lawless, what's the most infamous crimes that uh, El Camelo oversaw? Well, there was a house party going on with about 15 young teenagers uh, in Juarez and El Camelo sent Supposedly about 20 AK-47 armed gunmen slaughtered them all. There really was no strong evidence that the kids were involved in the drug business. But the thing that got El Camelo and his Barrio Azteca assassins enough on the U.S. radar to go down was when they hit a Mexican-American woman named Enriquez who gunned down on her way to cross the border with her husband leaving a kid's birthday party. Now, Enriquez worked at the U.S. consulate. She was involved in mm, processing visa applications. Officials say one of the suspects in the you know, three people linked to the U.S. consulate in Mexico says his gang was hunting for the vehicle. And uh, El Chapo had, had several rival cario groups, Los Mexicales, and the artists of assassination and Barrio Azteca and their commanders felt that she was helping the rival Sicarios get visas so they could pass uh, over the border and back easily. They could go into El Paso, do reconnaissance against uh, Juarez people hiding out over, or, you know, that were in the safe zone over there. So it was like, you fight in Juarez, you go back over to El Paso to hide. But they knocked her down. She was four months pregnant. They sprayed her in the car along with her husband. They also killed another guy who was a husband of a consulate employee because his car looked the same. And, you know, that was probably the biggest thing since the Kiki Camarena murder. And we know how much uh, attention from U.S. law enforcement that caused. They just brought Carl Quintero back into custody for that. And that happened all the way back in 85. And once uh, that woman who was probably, I mean, though the, the U.S. Uh, State Department didn't want to comment any further, I don't see why Barrio Azteca's El Camelo would have made that up in court. He said that was the reason. But once that happened, uh, the crackdown came and they started kicking doors in El Paso and started bringing people into custody. And in, in El Paso itself, some of the same tactics that the narcos have started using in Mexico where it's not just about uh, las drogas, it's about taxing businesses. They were taxing uh, store owners in certain parts of El Paso who supposedly were selling drugs, but they also had regular stores. So El Paso is one of the safest cities in the country, but if you think of it as just the nice part 
of a mega city of which Juarez is the bad part and you average out the crime rates, well, it's not so safe. As many of the people getting killed in Juarez live in El Paso, many of the people doing the killings in Juarez would live in El, live on El Paso side. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit arbitrary. And in this age of defunding the police, we're seeing our crime rates go up. We're seeing uh, fentanyl and crystal become uh, the important drugs and Mexicans don't need to grow those in the Sierra Madre. They don't need to get it from Colombians. They get the precursor chemicals. They can make it right on the border. The border is probably gonna get hotter and hotter. It's scary. I mean, cities can go from safe to not safe very rapidly. Places like Nuevo Laredo, Tijuana, and Juarez themselves 30, 40 years ago were very safe for American tourists. Uh, worse you might, it might happen, you might get uh, pickpocketed or sold some mint leaves instead of marijuana. And uh, for example, like Louisville, since the Breonna Taylor uh, situation, Louisville police has been under the gun, a lot of corruption in Louisville police. They're quitting, they're not pulling people over. Uh, Louisville's gone from a uh, very average U.S. city in terms of violent crime. It's murders gone from about f an average of 50 between 80 and 1985 to uh, in 2021 and 2022. It's on pace to be close to 200. So quadrupled because the situation on the ground changed. So if something like that starts to happen in uh, Tijuana, El Paso, America would be a different place. People like El Camelo leading the charge and his Sicarios. Now things got so violent in Juarez, uh, there came a time during the wars that the El Paso Barrio Azteca members were ordered to stay away from Juarez to avoid being kidnapped or killed. Um, some of the people, according to uh, El Camelo, disobeyed the instructions and they tried to cross over to get stuff and smuggle it across the border for profit and if they got caught like if they were working with barrio azteca members that were in bad standing they had uh snitched broken the gang rule didn't do what they were said and they were hiding out in juarez and you went over there to meet with them and get some you know because people do a lot of smuggling in small scales on their own you might go over there and get a quarter kilo of heroin one kilo of cocaine 50 pounds of weed they were killing barrio azteca members and uh, chopping them up and making them disappear on the Juarez side. So in summary, uh, you know, eight murder a day quota for El Paso gang members in Juarez, a Mexican city, uh, brutally killed 15 possibly innocent uh, high school students just to send a message and uh, sophisticated enough operatives to have intelligence that a U.S. consulate worker was selling visas or something to their rival Sicarios, the uh, Artists of Assassination, quite an interesting name for El Chapo's team, and instead of worrying about knocking all them off, they knocked off the source of their visas to try to slow their movement into El Paso. So during the peak of all this, uh, Juarez had 2,600 murders with the population of 1,300, giving it a homicide rate of 200 per 100,000. Only Medellin in its peak around 1990, which got up close to 400, uh, was higher than that. And it was the birthplace of the Sicario movement, like I said at the beginning. Uh, and, and that idea that Pablo came up with of harnessing these uh, young unemployed rough guys that maybe were just petty criminals and gang members put them on a small salary get them a little nice car motorcycle give them bonuses when they kill people it's created standing armies of trained killers so like i said el camelo cut a deal now the deal was against the barrio azteca leader arturo gallegos castrolon and he testified that Barrio Azteca had two teams sent to the city of Torreon to train with the infamous Los Zetas. And the Zetas, of course, were Mexican military who left the military to become, for a while, the most brutal enforcers and then their own cartel, though they've been kind of killed off because they were so brutal, the other cartels kind of combined against them. Um, and they were taught their ways by Los Zetas. 
El, El Camelo, a.k.a. The Pusher, a gang member from El Paso, Barrio Azteca, just one of many brutal Sicarios with perhaps dozens or hundreds of homicides under their belt personally and thousands that he oversaw uh, leading the Barrio Azteca hit squad. I think he's important and so is the story uh, because if the Sicarios themselves are coming from the U.S., at some point uh, maybe they're just going to start doing their work over here. So that was our first feature in El Dia de los Sicario, El Camelo, Barrio Azteca. December 30th, 2013, and one of the earliest Instagram influencers and content creators is arrested when he lands at Schiphol International Airport in Amsterdam. He was known for his fashion and showing you how to stay in shape and get beautiful girls. Kinda like Andrew Tate. If Andrew Tate was the infamous Sinaloa hitman, Al Chino Antrax, I need you to like, share, and subscribe so you can keep following my Sicario series. Go ahead and do it. Do it now. Subscribe. There you go. Boom. Now, I've been to Schiphol Airport and it's the main artery into all of Europe. You can land there and get on a train right at the airport. It'll take you all the way to St. Petersburg, Russia and probably beyond. Uh, and Jose Rodrigo Gamboa, aka El Chino Antrax, could have been going anywhere when he landed, but instead he ended up being taken to the only place he definitely didn't want to go. Los Estados Unidos, where he was under indictment for narco trafficking into San Diego. But let's go back less than uh, 90 days uh, to October 18th of 2013. <laughs> The man dressed as the homicidal clown was almost certainly working for none other than El Chino Antrax. The place was the high-end resort community of Los Cabos. You might have heard of it. American celebrities are often spotted there. The victim was celebrating his 64th birthday. He'd only been out of prison, both in Mexico and the U.S., for five years when this happened. Francisco Ariano Felix was his name, and Narco Traficante was his game. Senor Ariano was grabbed by the Mexican government back in 93 as part of the fallout when a Roman Catholic cardinal caught a few hot ones uh, at the Guadalajara airport up to the big Vatican in the sky, probably under Francisco's orders. Uh, this was during an attempt on El Chapo's life at the Guadalajara airport. Now the Ariano Felix family, I think like seven brothers and one, maybe two sisters, were known as the Tijuana C.A.R. Tell. Remember that the increase in La Violencia south of the border was initially driven by El Chapo and his allies' goals of controlling La Plaza's of Tijuana and Juarez. Chino Antrax's hit on Francisco was likely to eliminate this washed up rival if he had any delusions of operating in Los Cabos, where Los Antrax, uh, a Sinaloa Sicario squad, but also traffickers in their own right and people that extorted local businesses and controlled the micro dealing of El Dopa in the area. Uh, and they got rid of him if he had any illusions he was going to have some action in Los Cabos. Now as an aside, with El Chino arrested uh, on December 30th of 2013, there was a woman named Claudio Ochoa Felix, you may have seen her pictures before, who supposedly took over the leadership of Los Antrax. And once again, if you're good, if you're my subscribers, and if you're not subscribed, subscribe to my channel and you'll get a story on El Claudio who was known for her resemblance to another evil woman, Kim Kardashian. But, you know. So like I said, Al Chino was an early Instagram influencer and content creator. I wasn't really being sarcastic. Here's a great workout he posted, showing how you can maintain a tight bod for your Sicario work 
and for hanging with Paris Hilton, a.k.a. the woman who got her siblings disinherited. But that's another story. Why do so many of these guys make their exploits so known, so in the face of the public and law enforcement on social media? Well, besides the fact that being an actual high-level gangster is often implies a great deal of narcissism, probably serves as a recruitment tool. Hey, look at us. We're living like this and we're not getting caught. Come join us. So, who were slash are Los Antrax and who was El Chino? Jose Rodrigo Arichaga Gamboa, a.k.a. Chino Antrax, grew up in Culiacan, capital of Sinaloa. Of course, we know who comes from there. His father was a small-time political official, and he wanted to be an Air Force pilot, but he had the skin condition psoriasis, so the Mexican military took a pass. So then he started going to college for architecture, which is one of those professions that sounds cool, but doesn't really have has a limited job opportunities in the real world and he got married and had a kid and he dropped out of college to take advantage of a job opportunity his next door neighbors offered none other than the family of El Mayo Zabata, one of El Chapo's equals in the Sinaloa Federation. So Chino Antrax definitely did not grow up poor unlike El Chapo or El Mayo for that matter. He was uh, living at least next to one of the family homes of uh, El Mayo's family. Now, at first, according to his lawyers, when he pled guilty, El Chino was doing small errands for El Mayo's sons, who included Vicente, who famously testified against El Chapo and turned in $1.2 billion to the U.S. government in exchange for an 11-year prison term, which means he's out and about in the free world as we speak. But at some point before 09, El Chino Antrax became a member of a newly formed Sicario cell named after that deadly nerve agent, Anthrax. And the members all had tattoos and they also wore rings. And this group was initially tasked with the security for El Mayo's, El Mayo's family. But in narco land, the best defense is an aggressive offense and thus Los Anthrax morphed into for time probably the most important and definitely the most infamous, famous of the Sicario crews, the paramilitaries under the Sinaloa umbrella of trained assassins of people capable of going off on their own and performing hits or raising up groups of local pistoleros to take over ranches and towns. In 2010, there was a huge gun battle between Los Antrax led pistoleros and uh, breakaway Zetas who were hired, backed, partnered with the Beltran Leva brothers who had been part of the Sinaloa Federation and then did their own thing. 30 people were murked at one time in this gun battle in Sonora, not far from the hotly contested Juarez border crossing. Now by 2011, Los Antrax must have been very active and very destructive and deemed a major source of power for the Sinaloans. Because on the 1st of November 2011, during an indoor football game in front of thousands of people in Culiacan, an armed commando group, other Sicarios, interrupted the game and uh, grabbed a guy named Francisco Ars Rubio, the leader at that time of Los Antrax, out of the uh, stands and, and, and took him down, uh, I guess, to the field, made him and the soccer lay, players lie down on the ground. They grabbed one of the team's managers uh, and knocked off the team's manager and Ars Rubio in a weekend. That leader of Los Antrax was uh, murked in front of the soccer fans. The state of Sinaloa saw 20 homicides as retaliation. So he was important and they hit back fast. In one incident, Los Antrax from a bridge in a small town in another incident at a volleyball game in Culiacan, uh, they the volleyball game, knocked off eight people, hurt a few others. The people that knocked off that leader of Los Antrax were Los Mazateclos, aka the guys from Mazatlan, which is another city in Sinaloa, and they got allied with the Beltran Levis uh, when they broke away. So the Beltran Levis were a big operation themselves. They broke away, they were paying the Zetas up in the north, and that's where Los Antrax bandled them. 
and they were paying these Mazatlans down in Sinaloa, sort of on the Pacific coast, a little bit south. So that's how effective and big Los Antrax were. They were fighting Zetas in the north and these other set of guys in the south and were able to handle a two-pronged war. Of course, they weren't the only Sicarios under the Sinaloa umbrella. Before Ars Rubio was knocked off, Los Antrax made some power moves like assassinating the two nephews of Amado and Vicente Carrillo Fuentes, the Lord of the Skies, you might have heard of them, who of course were part of the Juarez power structure up in the north. So just to keep a clear picture for you, from 89 to 93, Sinaloa fought to take over Tijuana, and then in the early 2000s, it attempted to take over the Juarez Plaza and was mostly though not totally successful in Juarez, though they weren't Tijuana, which resulted in the extended period of Juarez being the world's homicide capital. Now at the beginning of this story, I told you that El Chino likely oversaw the clown hit on Francesco Ariano Felix, a Tijuana leftover, and I just mentioned that Ars Rubio led Los Antrax's hits on members of the Carrillo Fuentes clan, I mean, huge power players up in Juarez, and I mentioned that, you know, they fought the Zetas, the Beltran Levas. So Los Antrax was definitely involved all around the country in very important actions. So thus, El Chino Antrax is the leader of the group after Ars Rubio's untimely demise in front of thousands of soccer fans. Definitely, uh, I mean, probably the most infamous and powerful Sicario in all of Narcoland and a trafficker in his own right as New Year's Eve 2013 approached and he was going to land in Amsterdam. Now the Sinaloa operation is actually referred to in Mexico usually as a federation, a group of independent mini mafias that work together and Los Antrax certainly held their own areas of power like Los Cabos and had their own trafficking lines, which is what got El Chino indicted out of the San Diego Federal District. Now, while El Chino would blur his face in his social media posts, international law enforcement was slowly tightening the noose around him, and when he landed at Schiphol in Amsterdam, the feds were sure the man they arrested was Gamboa by the distinctive Antrax ring he wore on his finger, which was often spotted on his copious social media feed. Now, before his arrest, he'd been living undercover using the name of a deceased Mexican man altering his features with plastic surgery and trying to remove his fingerprints, according to the U.S. prosecutors. Now, like I said, shy pole in Amsterdam is your ticket to damn near anywhere in all of Eurasia by plane, train, or automobile, so he almost got away. Now, the ring of people in the San Diego area tied to El Chino had $28 million in cash seized during the time they were investigated, so they were no small potatoes. And during the four more years, uh, El Chino sat in federal custody working out a plea deal, El Chapo was taken into custody. And the former Instagram influencer spent uh, the final 32 months before he took his plea in solitary confinement, conditions that his lawyer said gave him auditory hallucinations, caused him to lose weight and stay awake much of the night. Sounds like the US government was ke keeping him safe and under pressure, aka he was telling. And just five short months after his boss's partner and sometime rival for Sinaloan supremacy, Joaquin Shorty Guzman was sentenced to many, many life terms of no parole at the Florence ADX Supermax prison under the Rocky Mountains. El Chino Antrax, former leader of Sinaloa's most important paramilitary Sicario cell and a trafficker of enough significance in his own right that $28 million in cash was seized from his group in San Diego was given just seven years. Before being sentenced, uh, Mr. Arachiga Gamboa, a.k.a. El Chino, dressed in an orange jumpsuit of federal custody, expressed his remorse to the judge, quote, I'm truly ashamed. I promise you I will never again go the wrong way. I would like to be able to work honestly. Well, in early 2020, El Chino Antrax left U.S. federal prison and started parole in San Diego. On May 6, his parole officer went to his house after he didn't show up for report day. But two weeks later, Mr. Gamboa, his sister, and her husband were found in a BMW down in Culiacan. His own wife had been kidnapped 
Orchard Raid and Red Rum back in 2014, right after El Chino's incarceration. The fact that he returned to Sinaloa, to Culiacan, where all the power players were at, El Mayo's sons and El Chapo's sons and etc., must have meant he thought he was more than safe. But, but he snitched, you might say. Well, sometimes in a case as big as El Chapo's, or the target is a done deal anyways, you let other important people snitch since the boss is cooked anyways, and then they get back into the fold and get back to business. This has certainly happened before here in the U.S., definitely lots down in Mexico. But apparently, El Mayo didn't see it that way, or more likely, El Chapo's sons wanted him muerto, and they got to him before he got to safety with El Mayo or family members of the various victims of Los Antrax ambushed them, or knowing how things go with those people, I'd say the most likely scenario is that El Mayo's group told El Chino he'd be safe, and he went towards them, but they were actually serving him up to Los Chapitos, El Chapo's sons, or even his brother, who was quietly one of the big power players too. Anthrax, a deadly substance to all that come in contact with it. And for the members of Los Anthrax, even them themselves, and only a few may even still be alive. Excuse me, are you Michael Jordan? Uh, are you Michael Jordan? Come on, Timmy. Us? Huh? Then Tim, to Ramon Ariano Felix, the monster of Tijuana, made an ad to the David Letterman show. The narcos all kind of come and go in a blur of names. Uh, but uh, one of the more famous family names you might remember hearing about, the Ariano Felix C-word out of Tijuana. Now, Tijuana right now is the murder capital of the world. 134 murders to 100,000 people, which is about double what the highest cities in America ever obtained. No, down in Tijuana, the Ariano Felix brothers uh, really corrupted the elite youth of the city of Tijuana. Now, Tijuana is a city who founded advice. It was built really for the purpose of servicing Americans when prohibition started. So Tijuana only came into existence uh, in the night, uh, I don't know when, like early 1920s for Americans to go and drink liquor. As late as 1950, it only had 65,000 people. It's up to about 2 million now. Uh, at some point in the early 80s, late 70s, maybe around 1980, the Ariano Felix brothers kind of show up in town and they weren't really anybody of note. They'd come from Sinaloa. And, uh, you know, it's when we think of the Mexican narco culture, it's really the culture of the Sinaloa Cowboys. I mean, almost everybody we know of is from that same area. But anyways, the Ariano Felix brothers show up. They were young guys, cool. Some of them had some, there was five brothers. And um, there's all these articles about how the children of Tijuana's legal elite, like the people that uh, owned the businesses, the people that were going to the Tijuana Country Club, sucked into the vortex of their criminal empire starting in the late, mid to late 80s. Uh, and by the early 2000s, 25, at least 25 or so kids of like Tijuana's most elite families had died as a result of being part of the Haryana Felix cartel, not to mention others who went to prison. Now, um, there's only two brothers, I think, still left alive. Uh, Javier, who was captured off the coast of Cabo in about 07. He's probably getting ready to get out. And then Benjamin, who was like the brains of it, or so-called the financial head, and he just filed a thing asking to get let out early. I would imagine he may have given information. But the most infamous brother was Ramon, the head of security, very brutal guy. He's the one who, um, if you remember the movie Traffic, and there was that hitman Frankie Flowers, who uh, they captured by going to a bar for men who like other men. But he was a rich kid. 
And it was based on some of these rich kids in Tijuana that were like, just whatever kind of way, and just got brought into this cartel lifestyle. And Ramon was the head of the assassins. And uh, Ramon was killed in a shootout with the Mexican Marines in like 02. But this funny, well, added story at the center of my story today uh, concerns the following his appearance on David Letterman. So in about, in 92, 93, there was the Archbishop of Guadalajara, who was a Roman Catholic Cardinal. There's only 128 Cardinals in the world. These are the people that when you, when there's a time for a new Pope, the Cardinals convene and they elect the new Pope. So uh, the Archbishop of Guadalajara, a big, you know, growing uh, archdiocese in Mexico, one of the probably, you know, 50 most important Catholic religious figures in the world. He was killed at the Guadalajara airport by, well, the people convicted of it are members of Barrio Logan Heights, one of the groups of gangs out of San Diego in the Logan Heights area. And uh, David Barone, maybe he was the ringleader, I think he was killed in the shootout, but there's a couple guys in prison for it now. Attempting to kill Elf Chapel was supposed to be coming to the airport, but they shot the wrong Grand Marquis and they got uh, the Arch, the, the Cardinal, the Archbishop of Guadalajara. But of course, he was wearing, you know, a giant cross around his neck and uh, whatever a Cardinal had, and he was shot from two feet away. So hard to believe they didn't know who it was, but these San Diego gang members were. They were some of this hit squad, so they had the elite kids from the Tijuana side and then from the San Diego side, they were getting hardened U.S. gang members. Kind of a reversal of what you might think. Uh, you know, there's rough people in the United States, like streets of the, the U.S. are... are so well, those people are taught to people down in Mexico how to be so violent, because like I said, in the 50s, 60s, 70s, Tijuana was fairly, was quite safe. Uh, a colonel gets killed, and it's linked to these San Diego gang members who are working for the Ariana Felix cartel, and Ramon, Ramon goes on the uh, U.S. FBI's top 10 most wanted list. And so they didn't know where he was at, and in 1995... I forget who it was, but it was an FBI agent, is you know, at home, and, you know, at night he's falling asleep when he's got the David Letterman show on, and they're doing a prank where they're out on Hollywood Boulevard. They're in front of Man's Chinese Theater, which is a big tourist attraction in L.A., and the cameraman is just kind of walking around, and there's this real goofy, kind of odd-looking tall and obese like Mexican tourist with the Michael Jordan jersey on and a big hat and some dad shorts and he just looks bizarre. Everybody it's Michael Jordan. Look everybody it's Michael Jordan. Look. Excuse me. Excuse me. Are you Michael Jordan? Uh, are you Michael Jordan? Dim me. Huh? Huh? Thank him. Oh, he's too Spanish. Well, it's Benjamin, I mean, Ramon Ariano Felix. He was hiding out in L.A. And the David Letterman show just happened to catch this guy on camera and uh, broadcast it so the FBI uh, knew where he was. But it was still another, it might have been 96, 95. It was still another, like, six years before he was killed. And he was killed in Mexico by the Mexican Marines. So, I don't they would got them on his trail in the U.S. and probably caused him to flee the U.S. But, you know, who knows what would have happened. Uh, like I said, his brother's trying to get out of prison early now. But, yeah, the Ariano Felix brothers, um, who's a legacy in Tijuana of these elite families, a whole lot of them saw their kids corrupted by the easy money of the new burgeoning cocaine business. I mean, Tijuana was the number one port of entry through the 90s. During the 90s, Ariano Felix, a one third of the yayo going into country, into this country, was coming through Tijuana. And he was known for riding around uh, in a mink coat and a red Porsche. 
with this pistol. Uh, one of the Mexican side witnesses who helped uh, or who gave a lot of information against the Harry on Felix Cartel. Couldn't figure out exactly who this person was, man or a woman, but they had a lot of private information about him um, going into rages because of his combined use of steroids and cocaine. And one, one day this uh, witness talked about being at their compound off Rosario Beach and swimming and looking up and realizing Ramon Ariano had, uh, had him or her in the scope sights of, their, of his M16 just for something to do. Now, I obviously didn't pull the trigger, but it uh, seems like a, 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 a psychopath, a crazy person. But that's just, uh, you know, kind of the fear as I'm looking in the United States. If the human being's behavior has to be controlled to some extent, and uh, I talk about it, I, you know, and these stories I do in LA about the drug use, and we see it all through society. At least when, uh, you know, it was bad to be a dope fan. I mean, people hid their addictions and it wasn't cool. They kept some people from doing it and keeping it more expensive keeps a lot of people's habit from getting too bad. But if, if we're not going to have police enforcement and drugs are cheaper and more prevalent, we could start looking more like Mexico, in which our case our criminals are gangsters could start becoming more like seemingly, you know, bloodthirsty, crazy, violent anarchos down there and just the drug trade empowers them so much and there's no checks to their power. You end up people with people like the Felix Brothers or the Ariana Felix Brothers or the Beltran Levas. Excuse me, are you Michael Jordan? Uh, are you Michael Jordan? I'm not them. Us? Huh? I'm not them. Ramon Ariano Felix, the monster of Tijuana, made an ad to the David Letterman show, dressed in some goofy tourist clothes, like I always tell you in a lot of these stories. You never know who you're dealing with. Better be careful when our nephews or grandkids might be in town from south of the border and we play for keeps. Al Profit, Tijuana Dope.